Okay. So I didn't record this in class, so I'm recording this at my desk. I think I can cover everything that needs to be covered fairly briefly. So this is us covering a global history of slavery. This is a problematic term because what counts as a slave or doesn't count as a slave has changed over time. And yet we, we understand that the institution of slavery is not something that just popped up out of nowhere in the early modern period. So today in terms of your study guide, we're going to be covering the terms surf and chattel. We're going to be covering a lot of different types of enslavement that, of course, don't use that term necessarily. And we're going to talk about like what is the actual history of the word slave uh, and what does it have to do with, with various things. Um, now, in class, we watch this video. We watch the entire video. So I strongly recommend you get a chance to watch it if you haven't, if you missed class. Um, but moving on from that, that, that video basically lays out some, some of the basics of Greek and Roman methods of slavery, called the Greco-Roman model, which is to say one that isn't necessarily based on race or religion. Um, it seems to be like whole slave societies, and the number of people who are held slave is not really surpassed until we get to the modern period, So, which is to say the average Greek household may have had five slaves or ten, where the average Roman household may have had is upwards of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 slaves per person. Um, and this also drives home that ancient warfare was more than anything else driven by the need to bring home captives to sell as slaves, right? Because these are not stable slave populations that are sort of self replicating right you don't want you don't want that because if you have self-replicating slave populations that way lies slave revolts i.e Haiti okay so biblical slavery is its own tr problematic topic largely because in, in this country particularly there's a lot of debate over whether or not slave owners in the south had God on their side. Uh, and the short answer is that both the Old and the New Testament have slavery in them. They both have clear support for slavery, but at the same time, both slavers and abolitionists have successfully used the Bible in their arguments, which is to say this: the Bible would seem to say that slavery is wrong. The Bible also seems to say that slavery is all right and that there are rules to keep it all right. Um, the Bible, however, also has multiple kinds of slavery that don't necessarily exist after the biblical period, like debt slaves, sex slaves. Of course, they have war captives like we see in the Greco-Roman model. The Bible also has the very problematic history of Noah, his son Ham, and his grandson Canaan, which is going to be used once we get to the early modern period to excuse treating Africans as subhuman automatic slaves. The understanding is that God made them slaves because they are descended from Ham and Ham was cursed by Noah and this is why their skin is black maybe. That's not really in the Bible but it's also in the Quran, right? This sense of, of the, the black the word for black means slave, right? There's a sense of the entire African population but of course the idea of African population, like that's not in the Bible, right? All it's talking about is that that Canaan, the son of Ham, will be the servant of servants. So there's nothing in there. It's not like Noah says, and you Africans will be slaves. That's not there, but there's the necessary tools for them later to read that into it. So if we look at this map, for example, we see this biblical understanding of the world. There's no new world, right? It's just Afrasia. And their three colors makes it very clear where do the three sons of Noah populate? Japheth in the north, Ham in Africa and the Middle East, Shem in Asia. And the place where these guys actually sort of combine tells you where the Holy Land is, right? Because that's where Noah is, so this area in what is now Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, etc. So medieval slavery comes out of the fall of the Greco-Roman model, right? Now, the Greco-Roman model does survive in certain pockets, especially in Constantinople. But in large part, the harshness of Greco-Roman slavery means that when there are no longer large-scale wars to basically keep on bringing in new populations of slaves, there isn't very much to, to maintain it. Um, but that history of incredibly harsh enslavement may it help explain the swift rise of Islam, which is to say those same areas that that maybe not convert in mass, but that, that willingly f go over to the Muslim form of government are in those areas that where the slave the enslavement was most harsh, largely because Islam has a very important set of rules that are different from Christianity and Judaism. 
Muslims are not allowed to enslave fellow Muslims. End of story. Now, if you can prove that this slave wasn't a Muslim at the point of enslavement, they can still be your slave. But you can't enslave their children if their children are Muslims. So the slavery becomes much less permanent and much sort of... Um, there's a sense that there's a way out for anyone if you're willing to convert. Now, serfdom is sort of the, the other side of this coin, where the former Roman lands that are now Muslim are turning to this Muslim model of slavery. In the north, we have serfdom. Now, serf is Latin for slave, so certainly in a, in a certain Roman model, maybe these people are also slaves. Um, serfs are peasants that are attached to the land. Like they're not individually owned, but they're not free to walk about. They have to be farmers or bakers or smiths or what have you. Right? Most medieval peasants are serfs. They're not slaves exactly, but this also explains why warfare in the medieval era is so different from warfare in ancient Rome, because if warfare in ancient Rome is fought to, to get captives to work on you know, farms and mines and plantations, etc., in the medieval era, you're fighting over land. The peasants come with the land. So serf is from the Latin for slave, but there were something like serfs in the Roman Empire, by, by I mean like agricultural slaves that are basically bound to the land. They're called villains. Villains. Like like villains like the bad guys in a movie is a villain. Now these folks are not very closely studied. Again, none of these I mean ancient Roman slavery just is no one's like topic of their life's research. This is such a niche niche area and those who study slavery full time just don't don't typically consider the it valuable to go that far back into the past. But I think it's useful to note that here we have this interesting institution that so vanishes that the word remains even though people don't know what it means. Right? For a villain just comes to mean, you know, not just slave, but just kind of a boor, a hick, a hasty, it's somebody, you know, a farmhand and and once that institution of serfdom kind of fades away, when we get to the eighteen twenties, it comes to mean something completely different, right? Just the bad guy in a plot, a plot in a novel or a play or an opera, or of course in a movie nowadays. So just to reiterate, right? greco warman warfare was fought mainly to obtain captives that would be sold in slave, into slavery. Not as much territory as changing hands. Medieval warfare is quite different. Land is changing hands constantly, but the ownership, I would just say this, the, the working of the land is not shifting so quickly. The serfs don't move, right? So the owner of the land might be changing, but the person working it day to day doesn't, which means two things, a few things, right? Field slavery, as we understand it from the Roman era, just doesn't exist in Western Europe. It's replaced entirely by serfdom. This also means that there's a slow general improvement in our agriculture because the same families are living on the same fields for generations. And they, there are reasons to, to farm well, not just to feed yourself, but just to like basically give yourself more free time to have more financial security. And this part of the timeline brings in the word slavery for the first time. So where does slavery come from? Slavery comes from the word slav. Slavs meaning this ethnic group of people who now live in Eastern Europe, Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, Czechs, um, Croatians, Bosnians, uh, Serbs, etc. Right? There are millions upon millions of Slavs, but from around the 900s to the 1400s, the dominant source of serfs or slaves or whatever, the servile class in Europe are these people, these non-believers. So like, I want to make this clear, right? this, this slavery is not at that point defined by color of skin. Uh, religion is probably the more important factor because the church has endorsed this rule they've learned from their Muslim neighbors. You cannot enslave a fellow Christian. 
And on those areas where we see this this main break between religions, between Christianity and Islam, we don't actually see much slave trading there. But it's much more like hostage taking where, yes, there are Muslim raids or Christian raids over the border, but they're not capturing people to put to work. They're capturing people to hold hostage. And slaves are actually being more and more protected, not serfs, but slaves are being more and more protected by a series of laws passed in the Iberian Peninsula, what is now Spain, the so-called seven-part laws. And included in those laws is a really important one to note, that no infidel may hold Christian slaves. And I only mention this because when we get to the New World, to the 1700s, to the early slave laws of the Virginia colony, they will see a similar law that basically says no infidel may hold Christian slaves, which will come in the Americas to mean Black people cannot hold white people, even though some of these black people are Christian, even though some of these white people may not be Christian. Okay, I have two sections here from this week's reading. The one on the conversos and moriscos, I'll just read out for you, right? If a converso or morisco refused to eat pork, pork, this was regarded as clear evidence that they were not real Christians. So here we have two words that might be unfamiliar to you. The conversos and moriscos are people who are nominally Christian right, in medieval Spain. Conversos had from a family that was previously Jewish, Moriscos from families that were previously Muslim. This could be a change that, you know, they converted five years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago. But the families remain suspect, unfortunately, right? So the understanding here is if a converso or Morisco refused to eat pork, because again, Jews and Muslims don't eat pork, but Christians do, this was regarded as clear evidence they were not real Christians. Failure to speak Castilian Spanish was taken as a sign of religious deviance or treachery. If a converso or Morisco woman wore colored clothes, this was suspect. Family get-togethers coinciding with Jewish or Muslim festivals, even regular washing, were also regarded with deep suspicion. Again, regular washing because both Judaism and, and Islam have as part of their normal devout practices like daily washing. Christianity, for all of its pluses, does not include hygiene as a part of its sort of religious practice. To satisfy their religious or secular critics, the conversos and moriscos were required, in effect, to adopt the culture as well as the religion of the Christian Spaniards, and sometimes even that was not enough. I just want to point this out, that this model, these people aren't slaves, and yet there's this sense that if you live among us, you must become us. This sort of forced assimilation, which we're going to see throughout the New World, right? So Iberian slavery does involve African slaves, but these are not field slaves. This is not chattel slavery, right? These are domestic slaves, more on the Greco-Roman model or the Islamic model. And these are slaves from all over Africa, from North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, Muslims, Jews, other infidels. And amongst them are also free Africans, especially of the royal families who are mingling throughout. So medieval Europe has many people of Africa walking around. Some of them are slaves, but not field slaves. These are like respected slaves, soldier slaves, craftsmen slaves, accountant slaves. And so, which kind of leads us to a very important question, right? Why was it that the New World populations of plantations were predominantly black African slaves. It didn't have to be that way. It's important to ask this question, right? It, it wasn't inevitable. So here's this other selection from the reading, quote, the expulsion of the Moriscos seems to exemplify the sort of racial exclusion that produced slavery in the Americas. Why then were the Moriscos not enslaved and sent to the New World? At the very time of the expulsion, Spanish Americans were buying tens of thousands of captive Africans. One reason was that Moriscos were considered a security threat. The possibility of enslaving the Moriscos and selling them, if necessary, to Muslim purchasers was also unacceptable to the Spanish royal authorities on the grounds that it would have been dishonorable. Muslims would have, been, would have purchased Moriscos only if thoroughly convinced that they were fellow Muslims. On the whole, Muslims regarded Moriscos as renegades, as Christians. But the Spanish authorities were the last who could afford to acknowledge this. All right, again, I have one of these videos on the Atlantic slave trade from Crash Course if you're interested to get sort of get a recap. So I want to now talk about Bartolome de las Casas, the single most important figure in understanding, like, what is it that switches the plantations of the New World over to using predominantly slave labor from Africa? And the short answer is Bartolome de las Casas. He grows up 
with holdings and slaves in the New World. These are indigenous peoples, Native Americans, right? If you want to think of the Mayans or Aztecs or similar indigenous folk, because he holds an encomienda, if you remember from the earlier in the semester. But he grows attached. He understands that this is a form of, of evil, that these are people who should become Christians, who should be trained and taught to be the equals of the Spaniards. And so he returns to Spain, gives up his lands, he joins the church, and argues that the New World is an Eden or a paradise, right, that we need to instead use African slaves, right? So at no point does he say, say that we should get rid of plantations, it's understood. Like, well, of course, plantations are necessary. Plantations are what make sense. Someone needs to work on them. The indigenous people are weak. They die. They're sickly. They can't be made to work. We should strengthen them. We should work with them. We should make them Christians. And in their place, we should bring African slaves. And the writings that De Las Casas publishes are widely widely popular in Europe, not just in Spanish, not really in Spanish at all, but especially in English and Dutch and German and French. And people use these as saying like, you know, truly the English, Spanish are the most evil form of empire that can be imagined because de las Casas, to be clear, can see the massive loss of life in the Spanish empire. And he b believes wrongly that this is due entirely to the cruelty of the Spanish, that they are like killing every man, woman, and child. But that's not at all what's happening, right? The vast majority of them are dying without having ever seen a Spaniard. They're dying of disease. And this is not understood. This is not really recognized. But we leads us to this debate in the middle of the 16th century between these two advocates, right? De Las Casas advocating that the black African should be brought to the plantations to work because they're healthy, they're strong, they're not dying from diseases. Also, they're a lost cause. We can't Christianize them. Where Juan Gines de Sepulveda argues just the opposite. The black Africans should be kept in Africa. There they should be Christianized. The plantations are good. We should keep the plantations, but we should use the indigenous people to work them. So it's sort of like neither side is in this a debate do you want to like be cheer for, but to be clear, it's the De Las Casas side that kind of will win out over time. And unfortunately, he will be sort of heralded as this hero of the debate, right? In this ridiculous picture here. De Las Casas is for universal human rights and equality. Sepulveda is for oppression and slavery. And that's, that's bullshit, right? They're both for oppression and slavery. The question is, De Las Casas is for the oppression and enslavement of black Africans. Sepulveda is for the oppression and slavery of the indigenous peoples, who he considers to be naturally abhorrent, right? That these are people left to their own devices who are practicing human sacrifice, who are cutting the hearts out of people, who are exposing their children, who are just leading lives of total sin. Like both of these are Christians who want to see these in populations Christianized. Okay. So I just want to reiterate here, like this, this happens at the same time that sugar is growing as a commodity, right? This is sort of an unfortunate coincidence that even though in the year 1000, few Europeans know that sugar exists, by 1650, it's widespread in the noble houses. And by 1800, every single man, woman, and child is eating sugar every day. Not much. By 1900, it's a fifth of the calories in the European diet. Nowadays, it's somewhere between a quarter and a half. This doesn't mean that you're sprinkling sugar and everything, of course, but there's sugar in all the processed foods that we eat. Like that frozen pizza you get has sugar added to it. Of course, not just pizza. That's maybe a bad example. So let's talk about chattel, right? So chattel shows up in the English language first in the 1200s. It doesn't mean slave. It doesn't mean slave. It means goods, right? It means cattle, like cows and horses and sheep and pigs and things that you own. And that's what it's from, this old French word meaning cattle, profit, things that you own, things that you make money off of, and, you know, farm equipment, animals. It's related to the same word that gives us capital, like the word capital and capitalist. When the word is used to describe slaves in English in the 1640s, from the very beginning, it means African slaves on plantations which is to say it is created to mean they are animals. They're not people. They're like livestock. You name your horse, you name your pig, you name your cow. Of course, you'll name your slaves too, but they are one and the same. Whether we're talking about sugar plantations, 
let's talk about sugar. So today, about 20% of the world's sugar comes from sugar beets, and sugar beets are grown in large parts of the United States, especially in the northern plains, right around Michigan, parts of Washington, and throughout Europe, while sugar, cane, is grown in the tropics and is largely still grown through methods of slavery. Um, here I have this um, documentary on the evils of modern sugar growing, which you know we watched in class. You can watch a little bit of it yourself as well. It's pretty depressing, right? Slavery is not gone at all, and sugar cane sadly seems to require it. Um, and we could talk about the just the other evils of sugarcane being that most of the Amazon rainforest is being cut down. It's cut down and replaced with sugar plantations, right? And of course they are, right? Because the world is a terrible place. We should just burn it all down. Uh, okay. So I think, thanks to the videos not having to watch them, this is actually a quite short little audio clip. I think that covers everything. 